Dr. Laura Berman is the world's leading sex and relationship therapist, a staple on daytime television and print media all over the world. From regular appearances on The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Dr. Oz Show, Good Morning America, The Today Show, Cosmopolitan, Marie Claire, The Huffington Post, the list is never ending. Her face has been everywhere, including her own TV show called In the Bedroom with Dr. Laura Berman, and more recently, her popular podcast, The Language of Love. Her work is so inspirational and her mission so empowering, helping others learn to love and be loved from a mind, body, and spiritual perspective. And the cherry on the cake, teaching people how to have better sex. Yeah, baby. Yeah. There's so much we could talk about, but as a spiritual teacher, I'm particularly interested in Dr. Laura's take on spiritual love, sacred relationships, and how spiritually awakened people can experience a more elevated form of love than what we've been used to in the past. So I asked her, how she sees relationships changing as more people experience spiritual awakenings around the world, how so many of us get stuck in toxic relationships, how she defines the term sacred connections, and what spiritually awakened people should do in order to attract sacred relationships into their lives. How have you seen relationships change since you started your career, especially as millions of people are now experiencing spiritual awakenings all over the world? How have you seen things change? Uh, they have changed in so many ways. I mean, our, our entire, because let's face it, I mean, this is the basic truth about relationships, especially love relationships, but really any relationship. When we are having a relationship with someone else, what we're really doing is having a relationship with ourselves through that other person. That's what we're doing, right? So wherever we are in our lives, in our awakening, in our evolution, that is going to come to bear in every aspect of our lives, but none, I think, more profoundly than in our deepest relationships. So, um, you know, and I saw this, I've been watching this, I've been watching relationships for over 30 years, so I've seen many evolutions um, as, you know, through HIV and AIDS, through the, you know, Viagra, through, <laughs> you know, all the ways that culture has impacted um, all of, you know, all of what, how we express ourselves and what's normalized and what's not normalized and what we're willing to show up, what kind of truth we're willing to claim what I saw happening certainly with COVID, and I immediately saw it, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> when all these people who have been surviving in these long-term relationships as ships in the night, like we can keep maintain the status quo because we're hardly ever together. And when we are, we're just talking about the logistics of our lives and like keeping afloat. And I'm not going to question anything. I'm just going to keep my head down and I'm going to just blah, blah, blah. like, and all of a sudden you have to stop your life completely and you can't go outside anymore so you have no choice but to go inside and you're stuck often in like a one little room apartment with this person who you've barely had a conversation with for four years and are filled with old bubbling resentments that you haven't worked through right so all of that was happening with covid in relationships and certainly with covid Everything changed, you know, and there are lots of reasons for that. I think COVID was a key catalyst on a meta level, right? Everything that it brought with us, death, fear, scarcity, discernment, like so many key themes to one's individual awakening is, was catalyzed by that. And none of us were the same. And so what we valued and what we now value versus before, what's important to us, how we want to live our lives, all of that has shifted, I think, for absolutely everyone, maybe to differing degrees, but for absolutely everyone. And as we evolve, and one of the key aspects of awakening that you and I have talked about um, is that you no longer view the world the same way. You no longer view yourself the same way. It can be anything from like the foods you used to like, you no longer want to eat, or you know, like for me, I am literally incapable of small talk. So when I go to my husband's business little social things and all these people that want to talk about whatever, you know, I'm just like, listen, I'm really sorry. I can't do small talk. Are you at all interested in talking about something real? Like that's what I have. <laughs> that's literally what that's I amazing. say to people. 
But you know, it, it everything changes. So can that other person change with you? Can they create room for you to change? Are you growing together or growing apart? Because I can guarantee tee you, every single one of us is in a major growth spurt right now. And I think yeah. that's one of the key aspects, or many of them, to how our relationships are evolving. Most of us were unconsciously, cre- we're always creating, right? We're always creating our reality. But we were unconsciously creating it and, and or we were consciously creating it without really understanding what we as unique souls, each of us really wanted. We were consciously creating it according to the fairy tales in the media or the stories our families raised us with and our communities raised us with of what a good relationship is supposed to look like or feel like. And I think what has happened certainly over the past three to five years, I've seen it on steroids, is that people are, each of us is individually throwing the rules out, at at least intellectually. I mean, I'm not saying that all of us are ready to do this in our actual (laughs) logistical lives yet, but we are saying, okay, like I'm alive here. I, I want, I need, I'm no longer interested in putting myself in a box. I don't fit a label. I don't fit male or female. Maybe I'm neither. Maybe I'm both. I don't love men or women or both. Maybe I just love whoever I love. Like, let you know, there's this real kind of opening of the boxes and throwing away of the labels. And then once it's all like thrown up in the air like confetti, you know, okay, so for me individually as a soul, what do I want? And then how do I, you know, and I've had that conversation with my husband many times in our, you know, I crack up because we've been, we just had our 21st anniversary and I tease him all the time because I am a completely different human being than who he married 21 years ago. And I keep so, changing the game and I keep expecting, and I'm very overt about it when I do. And I keep expecting him to be like, eh, nope, can't hang with this. This is where I draw the line. <laughs> and he keeps, you know, I'm ready for that. I'm prepared for that. Because I think that's one of the keys to being successful in love, especially as an awakened person, is that nothing is more important than that connection, than that spiritual connection, than your relationship with spirit. If you don't have that, you got nothing, including a good love life. So everything, at least for me, has to feel an, in- an integrity with that. And that sometimes means making hard decisions for, especially for a recovering codependent like me, you know, to really draw those lines in the sand. And so I've, I like prepared each time. I'm like, okay, I I have to be prepared that he may not be able to rise to this occasion, this bar I'm, you know, or this new way, this new thing that for him, he has to adjust to or put up with or accept, you know, and he does. Many people in my audience have experienced toxic relationships in their Mm -hmm. lives, including myself. Me too. And in spirituality, we call some of these heavy relationships karmic connections. What's your take on these connections and why they happen, especially to a lot of light workers? Yeah. People that are here to really help shift consciousness on the planet. Speak to that a little bit. Okay. I'm going to tell you my spiritual theory more than my logistical theory, because I could get into repetition compulsion and trauma bonds and all of that, which are important. Mm. And we can get into that if you want. But given you and your audience, I'll tell you my spiritual theory, right? Which makes perfect sense. And you already know the answer, I think. But look, we, those of us who are light workers and healers, most of us did not, a few of us I've met, came here and from the time we were born, we remembered who we were. (laughs) And more and more kids now are being born that way. But certainly in our age group, this was not the norm, right? Um, Now, you know, if you're under seven, many of these kids are remembering and retain it, right? But we certainly didn't. And so the plan and the path essentially has been, all right, you know, go into the earth school, embody, into the being that you're going to be and i'm simplifying here obviously you know and you're going to sign up for this shit show that's going to be the perfect catalyst of your unique gifts 
so that you can be in service to helping to spread light and heal the world, especially as the new earth comes in, which is what we all came here to do. So, you know, I like to joke that, like, I've always been the over eager A student teacher's pet. So they were like, who wants the kid with cancer? Raise your hand. I was like, whoop, me. Who wants to be totally emotionally abused by a toxic narcissist growing up? Me. Who, you know, who, who wants? I was like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, <laughs> so I was, but, uh, and you know, the list goes on. I, we don't have to get into the list. Yeah. But I think that we, um, and, and with relationships, and I said this to my dad when he was dying, cause he was a severe toxic narcissist, a philanderer. I was, I was my parents' couples therapist from the time I could talk. They're confident in so many toxic and inappropriate ways, which of course is why I became a couples therapist and a sex therapist. And I could see now at this age and stage of my life, even as he was dying with as complicated as our relationship was, how every wound he imparted on me ch changed the trajectory of the direction I was going, often in more toxic, abusive directions, you know, but those directions moved me into clarity and healing. You know, it's the path of the wounded healer, which most of us are. And I didn't really believe this in my early life. I thought, I thought you know, you don't have to suffer to be a good therapist, and you don't. But boy, are you a better therapist when you have, because you understand on such a deeper visceral level. And when you've had to create that own healing for yourself, which evidently I've had to do in many aspects of my life, when you have to heal yourself and go through the gauntlet, go through the fire, you're in such a more powerful place to lead others through it even if you're just a little bit beyond the flames than they are which for many of us yeah. is true you know we are lighting the way we're leading the way and so i do think when we talk about toxic relationships there are a couple of things happening one we are needing to move through, you know, our wounds are being manifest in relationship. Cause remember what I said, we're having, when we're having a relationship with someone else, we're actually having a relationship with ourselves through that person. Right. So we're, we're having to face and heal the abuser in ourselves, which is allowing us to maintain and stay with an abuser, which that's so big. That's so big. Oh, that's so big. Yeah. So I think that's what happens until we get so, you know, I always say that the, the universe spirit will kind of scratch on the door. And you, you describe this so beautifully in your book. I remember when I interviewed you, we talked about this, but how the, you know, the universe will scratch a little bit at the door, then knock. You still don't listen. It starts banging. You're still not listening. It's like, fuck you. I'm blowing the whole house down. Like now maybe you'll listen. Now maybe you'll take that step that you came here to take. But that you're, you know, the pain of being in a situation has to be greater than our fear of leaving it in order for evolution to happen. And so I feel like a lot of toxic relationships, that's the balance that's happening. And at some point, hopefully, for most of us, the pain of being there gets greater. Or the universe just says, screw it, I'm blowing up the whole thing. Because you're not, you, yeah. you're willing to take too much pain. <laughs> So it's just not, you know, you're not going exactly. anywhere. So let me kick your ass out the door. Your soul gets tired and is like, all right, enough yeah. of this. <laughs> so you talked about how you said something a little while ago, and I want to go deeper into that. You said, uh, we don't have to suffer. We don't have to. So how do spiritually awakened people stop manifesting toxic relationships? What's the key here? I think part of the key is in really recognizing your unique pattern or flavor, right? Like all of us, you know, okay, so you may be attracted to bad boys or bad girls or bad people, but there's usually a, a more specific um, wound that is being worked out, right? And I find sometimes it has to do with past lives, but more often than not, I would say the majority of the time, it really matches earlier in life traumas, and it could be trauma with a little t, I don't mean big t, right? So if you had two really caring parents and a white picket fence and had all of your needs met, 
but you know there was no, nobody ever really cared you weren't there was no room for your feelings that everybody was there for you and praised you when you were you know on the winning soccer team and made straight A's and when you didn't you didn't exist right like you were you know you you were fed and you were you know but nobody was interested in you and you were neglected and kind of um, shut out, right? Like that's an example of a really, what most people would characterize as a really small T trauma. But if that was your whole life experience, right? And you were a rel and you were a sensitive child, which many of us are, especially if we're repeatedly getting into trauma bonds, then it affected you. And you adopted a story that like the only way that I can be loved is if I am everything someone else wants. Cause we adopt these survival strategies were smart. So as kids with our little children's minds, we come up with these strategies to keep ourselves safe, to get the approval that we need to get, because that's safety, to get the love that we need. You know, this is a life or death situation for a child. So, um, so we kind of develop those patterns and then those patterns continue. And so we then become, on, on a logistical level, we are, we are unconsciously attracted to people that are going to trigger our shit. We're trying to make it right, right? Like, so for me, my dad, like I said, was a philanderer and a cheater. And my story was men always leave, I will always be left. And so I repeatedly, not with my current husband, certainly with my first husband and with every man before that, I would repeatedly get into relationships with guys who were so unbelievably sweet and caring and attentive and horrific cheaters. And I wouldn't necessarily see it at first, but I would unconsciously smell it on them, right? Or the person that was raised, and I didn't know. I was just like, oh, I like their smell, you know, metaphorically and literally, right? <laughs> that's what I yep. say. Like people get mad at me when I say this, but I really mean it. When you meet someone, and you've got butterflies, like the anxious butterflies, that is actually not a good thing. That is your body. Oh body's... my God, can, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that again? That is so important. Yeah, when you get butterflies, that anxious like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? You know, like that really anxious feeling of butterflies, I got butterflies when we met. That is your body's warning system saying, danger, danger, this is danger, right? What you should feel when you're with the one or one who will be the one, there may be more than one, we can get into that too. But when you are with someone who's really going to be good for you, is still excitement. Of course, you feel tremendous sexual attraction, you feel excitement, but it's like the excitement of being about to move into your dream home. That's not an anxious excitement. You know, that's yeah. like a anticipatory excitement. That doesn't give you butterflies, right? Are you going to get butterflies before you open the door to your dream house that you've designed and is perfect for you? No. You're going to have heart-filling, heart-expanding, screaming for joy, that kind of excitement, which is very different yeah. than butterflies. It feels more secure. Like the energy yeah. as you're describing it, it feels more there's a groundedness to it yes. versus, versus that anxiety, right? Would you agree? This can be taken away from me. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'll measure up. This is really scary, but exciting, scary. You know, we love scary, right? And we equate that with excitement, but that's not the kind of excitement that sustains a long lasting, deeply loving relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, relationships are changing yeah right they're changing a lot especially as we're going through millions of us i wouldn't say there are seven billion people on the planet and i i would say millions of people are going through spiritual awakenings right now um people are becoming more spiritual mm -hmm. people now want to unplug from old relationship templates and create new ones mm -hmm. but the templates for these new sacred relationships they're not well established on earth so what do you think are the key characteristics of a more elevated connections like sacred relationships? Yeah, you know, for everybody it's gonna be different, but I think there are some common denominators. One is complete authenticity, right? So what I think the key core 
base component of what allows a relationship to be sacred is complete safety to show up as your authentic self. Now, that doesn't, by safety, that does not mean that you can be and do anything you want and I'm just going to sit back and say, cool, let's do it, right? Because I'm going to ha- I'm showing up as my authentic, complete self too and our needs may not, right? And our wants may not be perfectly aligned. But if there is deep safety, meaning I fully accept you for who you are, you can show up as your true authentic self. You don't need to bend yourself into pretzels. You don't have to pretend to be something you're not. And I have such deep faith in our, each of us as sacred souls, but also the two of us together, that we will be able to find the win-win that we'll be able to find a common ground that both of us feel good about, where one doesn't need to kind of totally sacrifice their aliveness or their values or their needs for the other. And and that real love in its truest form, not possessive love or immature love or unsacred love, is that if I love you, I can't possibly hurt you because you are part of me and I am part of you. So if I am going to mistreat you or be cruel to you, I, it's like I'm doing it to myself. And so if, if you have that premise, right, where, okay, I want, and you, and the other really huge aspect of sacred relationships is the true heart centered understanding of what I said earlier, that when I'm having a relationship with you, of course, you're your own unique, beautiful soul that I'm choosing to kind of merge and live with mine. But I also recognize that my experience of our relationship is about me, right? It's me having a relationship with you is really me having a relationship with myself through you. So as a result of that, I'm going to not only take 100% responsibility for all of my shit and my shadows, and I'm going to be open to learning and growing and And I'm going to hold space and safety and acceptance for you to do the same. And we're going to treat our relationship as a soul growth laboratory, which it is, (laughs) whether we, whether we acknowledge that or not. Soul growth laboratory. Yeah. I love that. Because we have to be able to have that flexibility to explore, huh? This, I'm noticing that like, I, yeah, I said yes to this, but. I don't, I just, my body is resisting it. I don't really feel, or I feel really uncomfortable with this direction we're going, or I'm not feeling in alignment with it. And then having this space and support, not like, well, you said you do this, let's, you know, but like, okay, let's explore that. Let's be present with that. You hurting is me hurting, me hurting is you hurting. Like it's really an allyship in soul growth and a companionship on this kooky, crazy journey where Someone else doesn't complete you, a la Jerry Maguire, which is like the worst line in romantic movie history. You complete me. No one completes you. You are your own beautiful, soul-filling, God-filled package, and so am I. And so how can we co-create together something completely new? Because a relationship is a completely new entity of a combination of both of our energies joining together into something completely new that has its own power and movement in the world. Yeah. And, and you talking about Jerry Maguire right now, I think that's part of the old templates, Mm -hmm. the butterflies, that, that excitement, that those things that you were talking about, these are things, these are templates and programming that's very deeply embedded to Hollywood movies, you know, your rom-coms, all of them. So we've been exposed to all this for so long. And now so many of us, like you're saying, we're thinking, wait a minute, no, that's not how love feels for me. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not the type of relationship I want to co-create, but but the templates, you know, we still we still don't have the rom coms coming out of Hollywood no. with sacred templates. We don't. <laughs> no, so we this don't. is new territory for us, right? We don't. We don't have a model, most of us. And um, yeah, and we don't have um, we don't have a roadmap. So it's really something that is an evolution. We have to be willing to kind of throw out the old rules. And people are throwing out all kinds of, you know, rules about monogamy, rules about um sex 
Can you break down the art and science of attracting a sacred spiritual partnership? What do spiritually awakened people need to do or work in themselves <laughs> in order to magnetize this type of elevated love? Uh, ding, ding, here it Ding, goes. ding, you should have asked that question first because I could talk about that for an hour. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, honestly, it's a lot of what we've been talking about. So, of course, you know, let's start with, the final, one of the final steps before we go to the earlier ones, which is getting super clear about what a sacred relationship looks like and more importantly, feels like, because everything that we want to manifest energetically start, it's not the what we want, it's how what we want is going to make us feel, right? So if you want a sacred, soul-aligned, elevated relationship, the number one thing you need to do is get in alignment with your own soul. Live your life sacredly and at an elevated level. Commit to that in your own life and commit to that in yourself and live that way because then you are automatically becoming a frequency match, right? So the only people, and we, you know, this is what we've shown with quantum physics, is that the only things and people and experiences we can perceive with our five senses are those that are vibrating in harmony with our own energetic frequency. Otherwise, they literally don't exist in our five senses. We cannot perceive them. And I could give you a million examples of how this works, but basically it's hidden in plain sight. You will not notice that person. They will not notice you when you are sitting in the coffee shop next to each other, right? So you have to already, you have to be doing your work. That's number one, to heal, to release, to elevate. And then as you're doing that, and I think the more you do that, the more you're going to attract in, you know, the higher we always attract in and are attracted to people that are at the same emotional and energetic level as us. So if you want a super sacred, elevated relationship, it's time to get super sacred and elevated in your own life. But then thinking about what is it like when, if I, cause each of us is unique in this way. If I woke up every day next to the most beautiful, soul connected person who's perfect for me, how would I feel? How would I feel? Not they would look this way, they would act this way, they would behave this way, they would have these personality characteristics, none of that. It's I would feel like for one person it may be I would feel playful and cherished and safe. For someone else it may be I would feel passionate and inspired and adventurous, right? Like what is it that really lights your soul up and how you wanna live and how you wanna love? How do you most wanna feel in love? Um, I actually have a quiz on my website now that I'm saying that, that shows you, because people often don't know the answer to this. How do you wanna really feel in love? It's right there at the top of the homepage, right? But many of us can do that for ourselves. And then as you recognize that, then two things to know. One, those feelings that you most desire are on the light side of the coin and on the shadow side are your wounds, right? So if you really wanna feel playful, then chances are most of your life, play wasn't a possibility, right? So you had to be the parentified child or you were abused so badly there was no lightness or whatever, right? So, you know, part of the evolution of attracting and getting ready to attract in that soulmate is in doing that work right, to heal those wounds so that you're really working from the light side of the playfulness or whatever that feeling you want to experience and then live in that place. 51% of the time, if you can live in the energy of the feelings, I'm not saying with another person even, but you want playfulness, you're walking by the playground on your, you know, way to get coffee, stop and Swing on the swings, you know, jump on your bed, like be playful in, because then you are setting your energetic frequency on the station of playfulness and you will perceive, connect to, attract in and be attracted to all kinds of people that cultivate playfulness, including potential partners, right? So that's how we start calling those people in is by really living from the place that we want to live with them. 
and I doing the healing that. that we have to do to get there. Yeah. I love the, yeah, the doing the healing for sure, because then if you don't do the healing, it's really hard. It's impossible to hold that higher vibration no, because it, the wounds are pulling you down. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, and the ability to be in that energy, you incorporate that energy, you embody that energy is so, so essential. And this is why we hear so many stories of people who are sacred connections and they'll say, you know, I actually manifested this sacred connection when I gave up on love mm -hmm. and I just, I, I stopped looking for a partner. I gave up on love, which is something odd to say, yeah. right? But what they meant was they gave up on the need to look or to long or to, right. and they just went and they lived their life and they connected to their joys and they connected to their passions. And then suddenly, boom, like the person showed up unexpectedly. Yeah, I think you can give up on the need, the want, my life is incomplete without it because that's all scarcity energy. But you, but, but you keep the door open. Right. It's once again, back to that. No one completes me or, you know, you complete me. Right. No, you are already you make yourself the most delicious, irreplaceable, amazingly flavored cake of your own design. And that person that door is open for the icing and and or the sprinkles to come in. Right. That other person is such a beautiful addition to your already delicious cake, but it's delicious whether they're there or not. And I think yeah, that's exactly. the energy that most opens the door to all kinds of sacred relationships. I, you know, of course, sacred love, but also sacred friendships, which are equally important, sacred business partnerships, sacred alliances, you know, all of it starts to happen when you live from that place. I love it. I love it. 